Thank you for the warm welcome, everyone. I'm Ann Gentle. I work at Cisco, and I'm one of the lucky members of the DevNet team. So DevNet is our developer relations group at Cisco. And you might think Cisco and think of like super expensive networking hardware. But the thing is, if you've ever had to configure that super expensive networking hardware, I'm sure you wanted to automate it. So this talk is about automation at its heart. And I am super interested in docs like code. Especially some of the experiences I've had in docs like code um, in open source, in enterprise software, all over the place. And I actually wrote a book about this last year to try to tell my experiences to everyone else. I originally was managing a team of technical writers at Cisco before coming to DevNet. And we were working on sort of an upstream, downstream open source, probably heard of OpenStack, the open source cloud project. And so that was my really trial by fire in the docs like code world. And I got to do a lot of work. Over you know, 300 repositories, um, 30 REST API services. One of the REST API services had over 900 calls. So as you can imagine, it starts to be really where you're looking for patterns, anything that will help you out. And it turns out automation and community work is a great way to work on this. So. I had a couple collaborators on this book. I can't give, I can't take all the credit. Um, Diane Squish did an amazing job co-authoring with me. She had been teaching other tech writing teams as well, and my editor Kelly Holcomb. So I have to give them a shout out. And then if you've heard of the Write the Docs community, that's a community that's really working hard to bring more DevOps, DocOps, that kind of world out into the rest of the software world, the rest of the hardware world. All of technology can use these techniques. So let me tell you a little story. This is the view of my front room floor, as if you were my robot vacuum. My floors look really good because of this robot vacuum, even if my kids have roller skates and backpacks all over the place. So here's your view of the front door. You're a robot vacuum. And the first week I had this robot vacuum, I walked in after it had automatically started, and I could not find the vacuum. It was nowhere to be found. I'm looking under beds, looking under couches. And I start looking around. And then finally, I started looking for other signs. And I mean, I was literally looking at carpet marks where I thought the robot had been, right? I don't know if any of y'all have experienced this. But it turns out I needed to look at something else. And there was something else in one of the rooms. And he was out of place. He was not where he should be. These are the adventures. It was my cat. My cat never sits on the couch, and he certainly never looks that way. But guess what? He was protecting me from this rogue robot vacuum. <laughs> but I want to look at this from the way that you might think about automation and you might think about docs like code. It, you seem to get really, like, I get really excited about tools, and I get really excited about super clean floors. So I love my robot vacuum, and I love my clean floors. But the thing is, you might have to look for other things that are a little out of place or other things that might be a little bit you know, worried about this new thing that you're introducing. And so the mystery was solved. And this is also the way that I'm starting to look at docs like code in solving the mystery. There are so many other factors in place when you start to do this level of automation. And I'm sure anyone in DevOps <laughs> understands this. So let's, let's walk through some of the ideas and frameworks. And we'll start with a definition. So it means you're going to use version control for source files. Your source files are the docs. You're going to automate builds. I think that continuous integration and deployment of documentation is the game changer here. You're going to build them automatically. You're going to make doc artifacts that are versioned themselves. This, this is where it gets a little complicated. You're going to test. And you might say, well, what are you going to test for? You're gonna, you could even test for spelling. You could test for product names that are properly capitalized. You can test for, are all my links correct? You can test for images. And because of the automation even in the testing, your reviewers can get more in depth in the actual technical details. And of course, publish automatically, please. That's a huge part of this. And then just repeat. Do this without a lot of human intervention. Try to get your robot vacuums running. So why now? Why is this important now? I think that there's a lot of facts, a lot of parts going on to this. So how many of you are in a workplace where people are still issued desktop computers that have to plug in under a desk? Raise your hand if that's you. A couple, right? There might be you know, security reasons for that. There might be um, other like performance reasons for a desktop computer. But I have not been issued anything other than a laptop probably since 
2003 or 4. And so I think that's part of the mobility of this, is that we all need a place to build, even if it's on a laptop. We all need a place to write docs, even if it's at the hotel before your talk, right? I think that technology changes are also a piece of this. There's a great slide on programmable API where they're gathering a lot of web-based APIs, REST APIs, and there's an absolute hockey stick in the amount of APIs that are out in the world. And I would imagine that's a tip of an iceberg where the public APIs are actually smaller than a huge amount of private APIs. Someone needs to write all of this, and the best thing to do is write it as close to the code as you can to keep it updated. And I think that another technology change has been the advent of webhooks. Webhooks are that trigger that let you say, on a pull request, build this thing. When I merge it, build it to production instead of building it to staging. And then there's also the market and business needs. And so what I want to talk about there is also that hockey stick of growth, right? But it's also that agile software means that the documentation has to move as fast as the code. It also means that there are sort of, you know, people who are going from maybe five APIs to a brand new product strategy around API first. And I think this is the shift that we're seeing at Cisco, where you have to find a way to scale, you have to find a way to be performant. So what are some of the goals? Why would we even try to do this? I've seen a lot of change, and I think that collaboration is at the heart of this. When I was at Rackspace, only two years ago now, we did a transformation and found that we, we had so many more contributors. I think our goal was like, let's try to get 10 to 20 contributors in a year. We ended up with 175 <laughs> contributors, right? So just by looking at ways you can collaborate across multiple teams, that's huge. And then when those collaborators can build the documentation very quickly, that's the performance factor as well. And then also the ownership and responsibility. It's not that no one's responsible for the docs, but that when you give people frameworks and tools, they will take ownership and say, I can get that part done. It's very similar to the job I already do. How about quality improvements? You can always look at some documentation and be like, oh, this doc sucks. But what I want is a process to make the docs not suck, give me issues, give me tests to make sure that it never releases in, a, in, a, in looking bad or incorrect links. And so this, um, this kind of trust in documentation is where the quality piece comes in. If people know the docs will be improving constantly, continuously, they are more likely to get behind this kind of effort. On a docs-like-code.com website, I've been collecting these stories of how people are doing these transformations. And so this quote is from actually a writer here in Austin um, at Pantheon. And so she has seen that choosing to host on GitHub has not only you know, helped with their tools and workflows, a lot more efficiency, it also meant that more teams could join in and they were able to tap into more people, more knowledge, th that collective intellect. And I think that kind of workflow adoption, adaption, is what, going, is what is going to help you get higher and higher quality reviews from tech people with the technical knowledge. I don't believe everyone can know everything about half the systems we build today, especially in a microservices world. So try to spread out the workflows as much as possible. Bless you. What are some more goals? This is an interesting place where someone who is actually a technical editor at Rackspace found that once she started using GitHub for some of her technical reviews, editing reviews, consistency reviews, even grammatical reviews that, that build that trust that you can actually English, that's not grammatically correct. This is, this is someone who could say, oh, I'm actually the technical editor in this situation, but the developer thought she was a developer as well. And so there's that identity shift where you can try to get people to show their value by working in the same tools as others. I think this also gives you a good content focus. The content focus being, you know, it's sort of like the speaker just previously, have you ever had to adapt to a standard or adopt a standard and no one wrote the standard down? That's awful, and I think that by adopting more uh, workflows that work with multiple teams, we can all start to understand, you know, make it easier to write those standards down. And I'm going to take questions at the end, I forgot to tell you that. 
Um, so keep them in mind. Don't lose them. So how do you plan for this? And, and having done this multiple times, I, I, I kind of want to take it in sort of a column-based look. Plan for your users. Your users are going to have a certain experience. They may or may not need to use the site on their cell phone. They may or may not have cell phone access in a data center. Get to know your users. Know what they're reading it on. Know what they need. Are they actually more likely to keep notifications on a wiki? Well, then find ways to get notifications to them through your process. I think that also it's important to you know make sure that you let your users tell you if something's wrong with a page. This is super important. So even in that user experience on their pane of glass, make sure that they feel like even if they're not going to write the docs with you, that they can tell you when something has gone woefully wrong or if something is incorrect. And you know, I, I found that anytime you can do licensing or access to the source, especially in the user space, it's, it's super helpful if you're working in a community. So I actually had, um, a little bit of a hiccup myself when I was working with the technical writing team at Cisco. I loved this Jekyll theme, and it was a basically a web developer designer who was maintaining it on GitHub um, and doing an amazing job. But my source itself was actually in a private repo, and since the theme for the docs and the docs themselves were so integral, I could get help from the open source project, but then once again it went back into my tightly closed source. So Planning ahead, probably if I could have convinced people sooner to put public documentation for the source itself, I could have gotten help earlier on the pane of glass for the end users. And basically, one of the great wins was that we ended up with a mobile-based table of contents. Sounds simple, sounds little, but it, that detail really helps people reading. And then plan for contributors. And again, it, they don't have to necessarily come from your readership. But make sure that we're making things that the authoring is fairly straightforward, that you can do side-by-side -side compares on GitHub itself, or the red and green diff makes sense. This is why Markdown, RST, ASCII doc, very simple Markdown is easier to compare than doc book back and forth with all your XML tags back and forth. And even HTML is hard to compare side to side. Uh, make sure that you are keeping your builds quick, keeping your reviews quick, turning stuff around. If somebody points something out, at least acknowledge the issue and let them know kind of a timeline for when you'll work on it. And what I've seen work really well is to have a trusted inner circle of reviewers. And so that lets you make sure that the docs will only get to the public space once you have that trusted inner core. And so that's where, you know, test staging dev, de test staging, you know, deploy is super important even in your documentation sites. What about planning for deliverables? Some of them are just large, like acknowledge complexity <laughs> where it is. And one thing that often happens is people are like, I need a PDF, I'm getting on a plane. Well, we can acknowledge that and maybe teach the user themselves, here's how you get a PDF. Maybe it's a simple download. Maybe it's a simple build the docs kind of step that you, that you document for them. And then integration, does it have to be released with the code or could the doc site be separate from the code? Try to think that through. Do you need to have a try it out aspect for your REST API docs? I know that oftentimes you want to have hardware backed um, Swagger files, Swagger giving you the ability to try it out directly from the web service. And then translations, I don't know if a lot of you have to write for multiple languages, but this is an important consideration, especially for tech writers and teams making large deliverable sets. Can you make sure that on each build, every language is built? Do you need just English first, others second? I've also worked in open source communities where French was written first and English was second. So start to think that way as well, considering your audience. And then of course, you're going to plan for the business. And I don't intend to have this be the last column, but I'll admit it, it is. Make sure that you're timing your release according to however the users want to see the docs updated as well as the code. Make sure that the licensing makes sense. If they want, if you want to be able to show that you're the expert in the field, you may want to release your documentation so that others could reuse it for training purposes. And then maybe you want to limit access Let's talk about like, you know, whether or not your contributors want to reuse it and make money perhaps by training others. That's a totally viable business and you could build an ecosystem around that. 
And then finally, globalization. And this gets into the translation, but it also, I want to make sure that we think about it in a way that you could enable a global community outside of you know North America first. If they're the ones who are really into the product, really into the use, there may be a reason to launch first in China, India. Think through that as well. And here's the thing. <laughs> a lot of you have been this around a while, you know, around this a while. You're like, uh, some of those are going to be weighted higher than others. And absolutely, you're going to have to make some tough choices. You might, you know, think about the authoring experience being super easy, and that may have some, you know, unintended or intended consequences on, say, the search or findability of the site, the privacy of the source or the openness of the source. And there's this fine line between sort of artisanal documentation and automating all of it. And so a lot of times when people hear docs like code, they might think, oh, put it all in the source, pull them out as strings, you're done for the day, everyone go home. And, and I want to like sort of caution against that. Find the balancing act, especially when you think of all of these considerations in a row. Now, sometimes you end up having to migrate. And so this is a great story from uh, Tom Johnson, who uh, also contributed this story to the Docs Lake Code website. He basically said, it means you're laying down a new highway while also driving down on it. So he had to migrate to a Docs Lake Code mindset. And so then you have to make choices like, do I have one giant Docs repository? Do I have 25 Docs repositories with 25 teams working together for a final you know, front end for the user? You know, he uh, <laughs> actually admits in this story that he went from a copy-paste documentation to a full-fledged automation. And so I want to make sure that people know that out there, there are people trying to make this change. And maybe some of you in the audience can help others on your teams make this kind of shift. So how do you automate docs like code? You know, there's a lot of ways to do this. Uh, I come from OpenStack, where we had a Python-based ecosystem. So a lot of our tooling was RST and uh, Sphinx. But we found that by, by having this continual integration, uh, people could just send up a patch set, get it built on a staging server. And this was huge for people to be able to review the source, review the output, make sure it was still good for end users. And that automation in the system was what enabled that. And make sure that the commands are the same. I know that I'm probably preaching to the choir here. But just make sure that your staging, your testing, your production environments are as similar as possible. You know what? Automate so that you can have you know, your, your releases built with the same parameters that are used for the code itself. I use tags and branches that could build you know, four different release versions. And then our source perfectly matched what was being output. And so you, could have, you don't have the cognitive overload. You can look at the branch look at the output, they both say 4.1, I know these versions are accurate, and tracking along. Um, like I said, always build to a staging area. It's always nice to look at the source code, but it's even nicer to look at it, how it will be output. And then, you know, there are a lot of ways to think about new deliverables that you could build in a pipeline, especially when you think about translations. If you can build English and Chinese at the same time, you save time for both types of reviewers, both types of contributors, translators and authors, and technical deliverable people. And then, of course, you know, automate for accuracy. If you can, if you can build relentlessly again and again, you're going to make sure that people know that, yes, we're keeping up with your code. Yes, our builds are as solid as anything you're building in your service itself. And of course, scrape the code comments if that's where the most activity is. Just build a great experience around that for the end user as well. Don't just scrape to really ugly output. Try to <laughs> avoid that. But it can increase the accuracy. Um, in OpenStack, with the 900 REST API calls in the compute program, the compute service, we ended up moving it all in, in as close to the code as possible. And so even with fast changing versions, and if parameters were added, we could keep up and constantly build the docs from that as well. Now I get a little excited about testing, because um, I just think this is one of the biggest opportunities we have in this space. Of course you're going to test to make sure it builds. And you know, even with like complexities in a development environment, if you can build on, say, a cloud-based system where the environment is always the same, 
if you can build in containers where you're pretty sure the dependencies are worked out, make sure that it builds. That's a great first test. Check your links, both internal, such as cross-references, and external to other sites. Uh, when I run you know, external site link builds tests, it's really funny to see what stuff goes down every once in a while, and you have to kind of double check. Or maybe that standard that you were pointing to, they rearranged their website and the PDF file is no longer available and they didn't really think about a redirect, right? So it's good to just continually check your docs for that. I love the idea of a linter for docs. So has anybody heard of a linter, linter for code, make sure your code's compliant? Well, there are now documentation linters as well. And so if you want to build a custom linter or if you want to use one that's out there, it can check for things like weasel words. <laughs> this is something that I end up writing a lot and it's where you say something like, well, just click the button. And it's like, well, just as a weasel word, it's not necessary. You can also get a, build a list of product names that you want to be in compliance. Uh, I don't know how many of you are Cisco Spark developers, but last week, Cisco Spark is now renamed to WebEx Teams, and WebEx has a lowercase e in the middle instead of the capital E. So this is a huge piece. We have hundreds of docs repositories that are going to have to be checked for this. Wouldn't it be great to automate the tests for that, to check for it, and also make sure that as people make changes, they remember, oh yeah, WebEx is lowercase e now. And this is a huge one. Can you set up an API service that will test the requests and responses on an API that you're documenting? This is where the real gold would live. If you can make sure that all your requests and responses are exactly what the web service can build, that's a huge win for your users and for the people developing the service. What about these quality tests in a review strategy? Well, of course, you can track how many bugs you have, and hopefully your doc bugs go down over time. And that's docs like code. That's treating the docs source as if it has bugs, as if it, is, as if it has issues. And it sure does, right? No one's perfect. And so this is part of the review strategy as well when you use GitHub and other Bitbucket, Git-based systems. You can track the, the doc issue by having someone log it even from the front end website. You can then, as someone fixes that bug, link the bug to the review to see for sure that it did fix what the user had reported. And you know, I didn't realize that you actually have to teach people how to be really excellent reviewers. Um, I think that this was one of my big lessons learned. I asked at a developer conference one time, what are some of your guys' best practices for doing really quality reviews, quality checks? And one of the tips was, when someone lands a patch, wait. That meant that I, as an expert reviewer, wasn't jumping in immediately and I was training others to be better reviewers. So then if I waited a day, let other people look at the patch and give their comments, then I could follow on. If I thought it was great, awesome, carry on, that person gets to be a better reviewer. If I thought that there could have been one other thing double checked, I could note it and then, that, then two people learned from it, the person who was reviewing and the person who did the patch. I thought that was a pretty good tip. And then I really like the idea of using a checklist. A checklist is identified in hospitals to save lives, right? Let's make sure that we have some kind of expectation set so that reviewers know, is the link checker working? Are all the images correct? Does this actually match the version of the software that you're supposed to be documenting? Those kind of things can really help out. And um, I don't know how much of you love style guides, hate style guides, but writing down what you even want for heading one title capitalization, sentence capitalization, is a huge help. I always want to check that whenever I'm doing patch sets for other people. And then I think it's really interesting that there are ways that you can edit an entire set, and I don't know how many of you know that O'Reilly also uses Git for a lot of their technical authoring, because their technical authors wanted it, right? But O'Reilly still has a really large way to do levels of edit. So someone might be a developmental developmental editor. That person can read your document and say if it makes sense at all for the intended audience for the tasks that they have to do. That's one level of edit. But there's also like a production quality level of edit. And so they would do this copy edit stage um, from their production team. And that's the does it build? Are all the links correct? Is it grammatically correct? That's past that developmental edit stage. 
And so when I do docs like code, I tend to prioritize technical reviews over grammatical reviews. Um, some tech writers can get kind of in the swamp of like, I really want this to be grammatically correct, but they haven't checked the technical to test the commands against a service. So I would rather avoid that trap, always test technical first, but then provide that professional eye, provide that quality level overall for the whole, the whole document. And then this is where, when I wrote the first edition, edition of my book, I realized that I had kind of left out in a very important piece, not the publishing necessarily, but the increasing complexity you get if you try to publish with versions in sync with software. And if you're trying to do translations at the same time, everything just gets more complex. Plus, as you decrease access to the source, you have less people who can help you with particularly thorny details like the theme going south. And so I want to make sure that people know that the publishing workflows are something that you might have to consider very, er very early on and think about some of the trade-offs that you're going to have to make due to the complexities. So super straightforward, open source. You only have to worry about web output. PDFs are not something that any user is going to ask you for. Ha never happens. Um, that you only have a standalone website. You don't have to integrate with some bigger website and make sure the headers match, that kind of thing. And another real gotcha is if you have um, writers or you know some of your collaborators who have to use Windows and you've chosen Jekyll, Jekyll is really hard to install. A Ruby environment is really hard to install on Windows. And a lot of the Jekyll docs even kind of say, ah, we don't support this. So just be aware, you know, this is the stuff that can be straightforward, but you might have to have little tweaks and considerations. Small teams are easier than large. A lot of this is kind of logical. Single repositories are simpler than 20 repositories, of course. So let's look at the complex side. Closed source, when you have to do PDF and web output and mobile, I don't even have mobile on there, right? When you have to do cross-platform, when you want to collaborate with large teams who are not employees, who might not be covered by certain licensing agreements, this is when you get into more complexity. Now, what I want to close with and sort of lead to questions I'll bring up is this is a picture, again, from my robot vacuum's view. But in the, <laughs> in the side here, all of the stools are like really hard even for a robot vacuum to navigate, right? So I found out I have stacking furniture. <laughs> Who knew? This is great. And this is the kind of things you also want to look for as you're looking for efficiencies in a docs like code. How can I make things easier for my automation? Is it moving everything to a single repository? Is it splitting it out so the review teams have less load? We can start to think about these ways and look for stacking furniture. It's at Target. I think the robots are taking over and selling us furniture. <laughs> but there, there are definitely natural tension areas. And I, I won't go through all of these. Um, I want to make sure I leave time for questions. But you know, there are things that happen. You know, getting resources for web development when your product team is like, sorry, we're really working hard on this hardware bug. There is no way I'm going to be able to fix your CSS bug. You know, how do you how do you control who does what, what gets done when on priority list? Is it the product team that's responsible, and so that's very you know sort of external facing, or are these internal docs? And so you really need to make sure that they get you know, strategically aligned with the, internals, the internal work being done by teams. Um, and, I, you know, I, I so agreed with the, the speaker before about just standards agreement. Make sure everyone's writing to the same kind of standards. Make sure you've picked your REST API standard before you get going. And then I'll just kind of leave you with what I think is going on next, but super early stages, and that is data-driven docs and code. And so I think that you do have to be careful with metrics. Make sure that you measure what you can, but then always look back and like, am I measuring what I really want to? Am I seeing you know, changes? And honestly, people are people and processes are processes, but behavior is really difficult to change. So also acknowledge that you can't always tweak everything based on data-driven. But there's a project that's called Code Words, and it shows these um, ratios between how many code changes happen versus docs changes in the overall overall volume. Maybe you count committers, maybe you count contributions, maybe you can even count lines of docs versus lines of code just as something to start looking at. What's a typical ratio of code commits versus doc commits? Do you actually start to see docs drift or the docs are drifting farther away from the code? 
And so I really, you know, this has been started by Troy Howard. He's uh, one of the developer.twitter.com developers. And uh, the idea is to build these tools so that we can analyze what are some of the best patterns for large teams, small teams, one repo, multiple repos. And then I also want to make sure that we all realize that there are a lot of people who need knowledge and need to learn from each other. And so that's docslikecode.com where I really want to collect stories. If you have a story of how you've started putting some of these practices in a place and you want to help others learn from it, please do. This is from a person in Estonia, of all places, and she's like, I could have used this a year ago, but now I'm really glad I found it. And so this is my list of what you can read um, from here on. This is posted, this talk is posted to SlideShare so you can all get a copy um, if you're looking to dive in more. So that's my time. I really appreciate your attention. Thanks so much.